Uh, okay. Uh, before uh, I get into the lecture, I would like to uh, place on record my uh, extreme gratitude to Johnson Joyce, sir, the HOD at SB College, Jacob Matthews, sir, the principal, and also Robbins Jacob, a previous HOD, for sharing his memories of uh, Professor K.K. Francis. Indeed, it is a great privilege for me to uh, deliver this lecture. And not just because I think of his contribution, but particularly because of his contributions to teaching. And I think uh, that is something that is extremely important. And given the research output that we are expected, sometimes uh, we fail to, I think, give enough importance to teaching. So it is indeed a great privilege to deliver this lecture. I must also uh, mention uh, when Johnson, sir, mentioned this uh, rethinking undergraduate economics education, an article that I had co-authored with uh, my colleague and friend uh, Rahul De. Uh, I think that uh, it is it is interesting that you mentioned that because that is something that I will get to in today's lecture, uh, through the course of the lecture and uh, towards the end. With those initial remarks, I'm going to uh, I'll start the lecture. And when I was looking and uh, reading up Professor K.K. Francis's uh, biography, what struck my mind uh, was his uh, education in BA history, his subsequent education in MA economics, and his great passion for teaching. And I thought that maybe when I'm making this presentation and this lecture, I shall focus on these three aspects. So in a way, I think that uh, the aspect of history of econom economic thought encompasses some of these um, details and ideals of uh, Professor K.K. Francis in some uh, sense. Let me start off by outlining what is what I understand as the current economics climate. There is a dominant paradigm here, and it is called marginalism or marginalist economics, and sometimes we also call it neoclassical economics. There is a certain kind of dominant empirics uh, that is used in economics, which is of a quantitative nature. And even within the quantitative nature, there are various tools that are dominant. It could be the RCT, or it could be a particular kind of econometric technique. And these two uh, things about paradigm and empirics also brings us to the question of rigor. You know, what does it mean to be rigorous? What does it mean to do rigorous research? Associated with it, there is also the question of relevance. How does this work that I'm doing, how can I understand its relevance? So what I'm going to try and do in this lecture is to address these two questions from a history of, of economics standpoint. There are various approaches to doing research in history of economic thought, to teaching history of economic thought, and I list some of them here. One is what is called hagiographical. So if I think that um, this economist, I really like this economist and uh, everything that the economist has written is great. It's considered more hagiographical in nature. You could do what is a rational reconstruction. So you might remove certain historical elements to make the logic fit uh, in a rational sense. Or the reconstruction that you do for a particular theory of Adam Smith or Ricardo or Marx could be more historical in nature. In history of economic thought, it is also very common to try and find antecedents or pre precedents to some ideas that we have today. There is another approach to history of economic thought, which is what, which is, what is called the cumulative view. Now, this view suggests that neoclassical economics is really an improvement over classical economics. And therefore, all that, I mean, you're just calling neoclassical economics as a modern version of classical economics. And this, this is quite the dominant view and sometimes which is presented in many textbooks. For instance, one could have uh, Smith's theory or Ricardo's theory in the beginning and only to say that these theories are wrong. And I am going to challenge this cumulative uh, view of history of economic thought and argue that there are two distinct approaches to economics. One is a classical economics and the other is a marginalist economics. And they're conceptually quite different. So this was just to highlight that there are various approaches to history of economic thought. 
Now the question of rigor and relevance and my reason for choosing these words, apart from uh, contemporary issues that I've mentioned earlier, is also because of a particular debate that took place in the, the pages of the journal History of Political Economy. And some of the people who contributed to this debate I've listed here, the, the context of that debate was different. They were talking about the rigor and relevance of Piero Strafa's economics and not necessarily the history of economic thought. So I'm my uh, lecture today does not really engage with any of those questions, but maybe there are some uh, indirect similarities or connections. So let me talk about how I'm going to structure my lecture. The first point, in order to point out and to argue that there is a rigorous way of doing history of economic thought, I'm going to explain, I'm going to take you through five different contributions that have been made to the literature. And these are by different people. And uh, this is not representative in any way of the history of economic thought literature. Partly this, um, this list is uh, emerges from my own interest in history of economic thought and in classical economics and my engagement with some of them. So, and in the second part, I'm going to talk about relevance and I'm going to talk about relevance in these five different ways. So, and then I'll uh, end with making some concluding points. So let me begin with uh, pointing out what I understand by rigor. So the first instance is of uh, an art, uh, a dictionary entry actually by Tony Aspromorgos and his engagement with Adam Smith's notion of invisible hand, which is used and misused many times in newspapers in journals in books, etc. Aspromorgos earlier has written has worked on uh, classical economics. And if some if you're interested in the economics before Adam Smith, this is a book that one can refer. And in 2000, Nine, he also published a book on the economics of Adam Smith, uh, which is a thorough and uh, rigorous study of uh, Adam Smith's political economy. But the piece that I'm going to share to you today and I'm going to talk about today is a much more recent article. This was published in the New Palgrave Dictionary of Economics. And now uh, the New Palgrave Dictionary of Economics is making its articles online so it can be accessed online. And this was published in 2020. Uh, just last year and this is a dictionary entry so uh, the the list of the five things that i'm going to talk when i mentioned rigorous uh, they have not only dictionary entries but there are various other ways of uh, uh, writing and communicating ideas so let's take a look at uh, some of the things that uh, that um, th that is present in this dictionary entry one is that aspromorgos argues that invisible hand in adam smith is really about unintended system level consequences. That is, if as an individual, I'm interested in um, getting more profit, and similarly, there are many others like that, it can have a certain kind of uh, unintended effect on the system as a whole. Although people talk about uh, invisible hand in the context of Adam Smith, there are only three instances where Adam Smith uses this in all his writings. One is actually in, in his uh, no, uh, pamphlet or note on the history of astronomy. The second instance is in the theory of moral sentiments. And the third instance is in the wealth of nations. Tony Aspromogos comes to the conclusion that the kind of idea that is found in the theory of moral sentiments uh, cannot re does not really have so much of conceptual rigor. In fact, he calls it a rhetorical overstatement to be able to uh, think of this instance as uh, un uh, some kind of system level consequence. The wealth of nations idea that in the context of understanding invisible hand is neither very insightful nor very compelling. But what Aspromogos finds compelling is the notion that Invisible hand is better understood as explaining competition and its effects. So in Adam Smith, when there is free competition, which is different from perfect competition, as in uh, neoclassical economics, there is a tendency for prices to gravitate towards its natural price. And this, according to the author, is what the meaning of invisible hand is. 
And let me now get to a problematic interpretation. Uh, in the marginalist general equilibrium research program, uh, sorry, there's a typo in marginalist. What we find is a certain kind of vindication of Adam Smith's invisible hand doctrine. So there are neoclassical economists who argue that, you know, we have found a solution for Adam Smith's invisible hand, but this is not quite uh, quite true. And in fact, uh, one of uh, this is often used as support for this view. And this is a book uh, by Kenneth Arrow and Frank Kahn called The General Competitive Analysis, which was very influential. So let me just uh, use this uh, quotation from this article. And the second part of the quotation says the following, that according to Harrow and Hahn, they are right, I quote, Smith also perceived the most important implication of general equilibrium theory. The ability of a competitive system to achieve an allocation of resources that is efficient in some sense. The problem here is that Smith has no such indication Smith has no such notion of demand and supply curves. Smith has no such notion of perfect competition. Smith has no such notion of efficiency. But still, this seems to be quite a dominant interpretation. And if you read this article, it is clear why this kind of an interpretation is problematic. What is the method? I mean, if you read this article, what kind of things uh, can you say exist as a method? One is going through the entire Smith uh, writing. It is not just Wealth of Nations, but there's theory of moral sentiments. There is early drafts of Wealth of Nations, and there are other contributions that he has made to rhetoric, to astronomy, etc. It, it has to be a systematic reading because it is easy to pick and choose which instance of Smith might give you a story that you want. So it has to be systematic. If there are contentious or if there are inconsistencies, one needs to engage with that and resolve it. It has to be thorough. And the reader has to have some sort of evidence to which uh, to whether the author is actually representing Smith. And for that, you need to have adequate number of quotations in the text. It is, in other words, you can say that quotations perform some kind of function of evidence, a kind of textual evidence. It is not just enough to read systematically and quote, but there is also a context in which uh, Smith is talking about these things. And one particular context this dictionary entry talks about is the link between invisible hand and Smith's understanding of science or scientific method. The other contextual element which is important for understanding Smith is the nature of capitalism when he was writing. The third kind of context which I think is important is the nature of argument. In what context is Smith making this argument? Very often the term invisible hand is used out of context and misused rather. And there is also a conceptual element in the method that is employed in this dictionary entry, which is that there is a distinct way in which classical economics is seen to be and conceptualized is very different from marginalist economics and for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Now, let me move on to the notion of efficiency. Again, efficiency is a notion that is very commonly used. Uh, so I thought that it might be uh, in, in, in interesting to take a history of economic thought, one kind of approach to look at this question of efficiency. And this is um, uh, an article, and this is written by Irene in um, the review of radical political economics. This was published in 2019. And again, this is a, a recent uh, journal article. Is competition necessarily efficient? An answer through the history of neoclassical theory. So let me just uh, uh, point out some important aspects in this article. The key economists uh, that the author deals with is Pareto, Morris Alley, Arrow, Arrow and Hahn again. And let's focus on Pareto because we often talk about Pareto optimality. And um, one of them, I mean, uh, if you're interested in reading more about Pareto, this is a book. Um, I mean, this is actually an edition of Pareto that was put together in 2014. And a paperback edition has recently come out, I think, just last year. 
what does maximum ophelimity for the collectivity mean this is a term this is quoted from pareto ophelimity in a way um, meant utility so it's maximum utility for the collective uh, people and let me just take a quote from pareto we don't have to read the entire quotation but i, I just want to spend um, a minute here reading this we will say that the members of a collectivity enjoy maximum ophelimity in a certain position when it is impossible to find a way of moving from that position very slightly in such a manner that the ophelimity enjoyed by each of the individuals of that collectivity increases or decreases so if you are introduced to pareto optimality you know that there is some relation to what pareto is saying here but this in wilfredo pareto's work was a criterion within pure economics by pure economics i'm talking about an abstract theoretical system which does not make any reference to the contextual characteristics of any actual economy and so for pareto but there's an other point he says that pure economics does not give us a truly decisive criterion for choosing between an organization or society based on private property and a socialist organization this problem can be solved only by taking other characteristics of the phenomena into account in other words what pareto is saying here is that this is a particular feature of a pure um, pure economy or a pure abstract economy and even in that pure abstract economy you cannot make a distinction and say that because of this maximum utility you can choose a market economy over a socialist economy or vice versa and he says that this problem cannot be solved by just referring to these notions of optimality or of maximum of ophelimity this has to be solved by taking into other contextual factors now let's see what happens subsequently to uh, pareto's criterion one the nomenclature got changed it was not called ophelimity it became efficiency criterion and according to the author one of the reasons for this changing nomenclature is to diminish the normative nature of this uh, criterion so optimality changed to efficiency and this was done um, by ale arohan and one of the reasons is to avoid some sort of ethical connotations so efficiency began to be seen as devoid of any kind of ethical connotation as opposed to how it it was understood earlier so again this probably this is an important point because often when marginalist microeconomics is taught uh, to us in textbooks and other ways a distinction is ba- made between positive and normative economics and often most of the theories including the efficiency criterion is viewed as a kind of non normative or a positive criterion and after this change in nomenclature and move to efficiency it became i mean it was used it was applied to evaluate economic policies and particularly this happened in the domain of welfare economics right so one can recall pareto's um, hesitation and his wo- caution in applying something like this to an actual economy but then this started uh, getting widely applied in, in in order to evaluate economic policies subsequently this has led to um, this group of uh, theories or research programs which can be called imperfection imperfectionism what i mean by that is you're no longer working in perfect competition you're interested in imperfections this could be information asymmetry or this could be labor market rigidity so imperfections of various kinds and this also sort of spawned the literature on market failures where it began to be seen that efficiency is valuable in and of itself somehow it became a desirable thing so what we see from this history is that how pareto thought of it as a description of an abstract economic system to it becoming a policy aim it becoming something desirable and it began to be applied to actual markets and in fact some of the economists who have done this work includes aro akerlof stiglitz and here i want to take um, i mean this is mm, the author's quotation which she has taken from this uh, book 
uh, Principles of Modern Economics, which is authored by Stiglitz, Lafay, and Walsh. And they write this. The benchmark that perfect competition models provides is also useful for another reason. It helps to understand the causes of poor market functioning when its basic assumptions are not verified. In other words, the concept of efficiency began to be used in a way that it was probably not supposed to be used, at least according to Pareto. So from a descriptor which was used in pure theory, it began to be applied to policy and now efficiency is seen as a desirable policy objective. The third point that I want to talk about in terms of rigor and understanding how different historians of economic thought have tried to study these issues and uh, brought some important findings. The third one is the link between physicians and political economy. And uh, this is some of the work done by Peter Gronewegen. Uh, he's no more. And some of his important work, one was his biography of Alfred Marshall. He also wrote, along with Gianni Vaggi, a, a sort of a textbook on the history of economic thought, which is called A Concise History of Economic Thought. And this work, um, this is, I mean, this work where he talks about the link between physicians such as William Petty, Francois Kenney, and political economy is uh, also a different way of doing economics. And so you're looking at uh, their training, whether as physicians and how that had an impact on how they conceptualize political economy. And this is the book that is published by uh, Routledge, which is based on his um, previous work. It's a 2001 edited book. So here I'm going to take a slight uh, change or um, and talk about early political economy, uh, which is also something uh, Peter Gronewegen worked on. And this is, collect uh, this is present in one of his books called The 18th Century Economics. Notably, the work of uh, the physiocrat Francois Kenney and uh, Jacques Turgot. And the, I mean, so the contribution of Peter Gronewegen here is I've just taken a snapshot of some of the work that he did at the University of Sydney, where he reprinted many of these economic classics. So some of them that were written in other languages, in uh, French especially, were translated into English and there was an editorial introduction. So one was finding these important uh, material that was not available and not uh, available for people to read and access. And so he brought together some of these uh, reprints of economic classics and they're edited by Peter Gronewegen. Now the work involved here has a certain rigor to it because one, you have to locate these important manuscripts, you have to get permissions, you have to translate it. And again, translation, is a very important uh, activity and it has to be done uh, faithfully uh, to the context and to the author. There is an editing because uh, as readers, we also want an editorial or the translator's introduction to understand the context in which these texts are written and finally republishing them. So this kind of a contribution is immense because without people who have engaged in service like this, it is difficult for other researchers who might not have access or might not know the language to be able to engage with uh, these important ideas. And I will talk a little bit about this uh, again towards the end of my lecture. And this, all, uh, the question of editing also is uh, present in the fourth point that I want to talk about, which is about Ricardo and his correspondence. Again, the volumes, the works and correspondence of Ricardo are multiple as the picture below shows. This was done mainly by Piero Straffa with the collaboration of another economist, Morris Dobb. And Piero Straffa is famous uh, in economics for his 1960 book, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities, where he, he gave a critique of neoclassical theory, but also a sort of revival of classical political economy in the tradition of Smith and Ricardo. But let, let's focus more on the works and correspondence of David Ricardo here. It's a multi-volume work and it took a long time for it to be completed given uh, its scope. What is the process of editing? Um, and he mentions in the, in the introduction that the correspondence with James Mill was missing so far. So they had to trace it and then finally get permissions and publish it. 
there's also a lot of unpublished manuscripts and notes which gives us an insight into different thinkers what was whether the uh, the ideas evolved or was there an influence of some uh, some other thinker what was was it to do with something else that they are reading so it could be multiple factors so unpublished manuscripts also give us an idea of these thinkers and one of them that was put together was called the notes on malthus where what ricardo did was uh, he read robert malthus's principles of political economy and took notes but they were extensive notes so this was then later published as a book and in fact i did make use of this uh, quite significantly in my in, uh, one of the journal articles that i had published where i looked at the role of effectual demand and extent of the market in adam smith and david ricardo so it was possible to find some things which would not be clear from looking at um, principles of political economy alone and this is the structure of uh, piero strafa's introduction so he talks about how the principles was written he talks about the important role of james mill again this is partially true through looking at the correspondence Uh, the chapter on value which is also a very important aspect for ricardo and for any kind of economic theory what were the kind of changes in value that were there and again in the process of editing it is important not to change the intention of the original author or to bring in too many editorial intrusions so a mark of good scholarship of ed- there are or there are rigors in terms of editing a work and which are marks of scholarship the fifth and the last point in terms of what i mean by rigor and different ways of understanding rigor rather refers to a critique of supply and demand which was put forth by krishna bharadwaj she is also no more and she was instrumental also in setting up the center for economic studies and planning at uh, jawaharlal nehru university Uh, she is uh, her work has been i mean some of her journal articles has been collected together as essays on piero strafa and other this is another work of hers in called themes in value and distribution and the work that i am referring to here is not any of them but it's a s- small volume called classical political economy and the rise to dominance of supply and demand theories this was first published in 1976 a revised edition was brought out in 1986 Uh, it was initially delivered as a set of lectures um, the rc dat lecture series what you find in her work is a critique of marginalism one of the notions is this idea of diminishing returns to capital and she traces this history to ricardo and her argument is the following she says that in ricardo ricardo assumed diminishing returns to land because land was idea of fertility that was present in land and if you kept producing or if you kept doing agriculture over and over again in the same piece of land or bringing new lands in over time it led to diminishing returns now this notion of diminishing returns to land made sense but she then argues that this notion of diminishing returns was illegitimately extended to all other factors of production including capital and she argues that this really uh, has a conceptual problem the other point that she again makes which is connected to this is you cannot put land labor and capital on the same footing this term factors of production which is revoked by alfred engaging with marshall's own writing and comparing it with the previous classical economists in other words what you find in krishna bharadwaj's work is a critique of marginalist economics but it means that you are clear of what the nuts and bolts of marginalist economics is similarly it gives you an idea of the basic tenets of classical economics and also of strafa's economics which is a, a modern revival of classical economics in terms of method if uh, i were to phrase a call it you can say that there are some kinds of critical comparative exercises that she undertakes between different texts belonging to different paradigms in other words there is a kind of history of ideas that is visible in her work now let me talk now let me move on to the question of relevance now one as i mentioned is understanding the past and this i think is what most people think of when uh, they hear the term history of economic thought history of economic thought tells us why there was a submergence of classical political economy 
whether it has to do with a certain kind of political movement, whether it has to do with a certain kind of intellectual movement. It also tells us about why marginalism as a dominant school of thought arose. Right? It also tells us that there are contending value theories. In other words, it tells us that there are multiple microeconomic theories. And I've just listed some of them here. One is the land and the labor theory of value, which is particularly found in economists writing before Adam Smith. The most popular one probably uh, is the labor theory of value, which is notably found in Karl Marx, but a version of it is also found in Ricardo and also in Smith. And what is taught today is only the marginal utility theory of value. Now, there is no particular reason why other theories of value should not be taught in any course. History of economic thought also tells us that Smith's economics is fundamentally different from that of Samuelson's economics. So if we read Samuelson's textbook, it is not going to give us any insight into Smith's economics. It also tells us that Marshall's economics and Keynes's economics are different and Keynes is trying to break away from Marshall. But it also tells us that there are similarities and there are areas in which Keynes could not really break away from Marshall. In other words, history of economic thought tells us that there are multiple approaches to study an economic system. And one could classify them as the scarcity approach, uh, which is the neoclassical or the marginalist approach, and the classical political economy approach, which is the surplus approach. The second point is, I mean, what is uh, how do we think of the past in the present, as it were? One is in terms of understanding dominance. Why is it that a certain school of thought or a certain concept or a certain method is dominant? What is the history behind it? Is there a certain kind of sociology of knowledge production behind it? What ensures that a certain kind of idea remains dominant? And I have looked at uh, in the past slides and uh, in the initial part of the lecture on history of some of these concepts. And I've pointed out to you why the notion of invisible hand as we understand it today without reading Adam Smith might be a flawed one. Why the notion of efficiency as we understand it in textbooks in marginalist textbooks is problematic. And when it is used in the service of policy, it might be even more problematic. I've pointed out to you even the simple notions of supply and demand, which is uh, Krishna Bharadwaj's argument that she argues that even a simple thing like the demand schedule or the demand curve is an abstraction. And is it possible to think of supply and demand in other ways? In the labor theory of value, do you need the supply and demand curves? So can we have multiple ways of understanding the market system? And the concept of diminishing returns, which again is a very popular concept that is used not just in microeconomics, but it is used in growth theories. Therefore, it is used in macroeconomics and in international trade theories also has a particularly contentious history and it remains to be seen and it remains at least one can ask the question whether this is a really valid extension that Alfred Marshall did by extending something as uh, diminishing returns to land to all factors of production. One can also say that it gives us a guide to the future because what it tells us is that ideas ebb and flow. There is a certain kind of transience to it. Some ideas come into fashion and then they go out of it. At some points in the past, general equilibrium theory was in fashion. Game theory was in fashion. Um, financial economics has been in fashion. Agricultural economics has been in fashion. Behavioral economics has been in fashion. Now, when the new Nobel comes, you have RCT, which is uh, being in fashion. So these things. There is an ebb and flow sometimes, some things get submerged. So I think history of economic thought tells you that none of these, just because they are in fashion today, means that they are the most rigorous. They could be there because of various other reasons. The other thing is presentism or an idea that whatever we think is important today, today, uh, contemporary, uh, cannot alone provide a reasonable or a reliable guide to the future because fundamentally if we don't know what the future brings one needs to study the past and everything that is uh, present to us 
much more systematically and much more thoroughly. And it cannot only be determined by what we think is important today. Because what we think is important today is also a function of many other ideas that we have obtained. I argue that history of economic thought also provides a kind of antidote to monism or the idea that there is just one way of understanding the world. And in a way, it tells us or it alerts us to the possibility of understanding the economic surroundings in multiple ways or the idea of pluralism. And this pluralism should be there in theory, where currently the dominant approach is marginalism. But there should be a pluralism in theory where we introduce students or where we are aware of multiple approaches within theory, even within method or within empirics, there is no reason to only favor quantitative methods, but there should be a pluralism of quantitative methods. There should be a pluralism within qualitative methods and even between quantitative and qualitative methods. And I think um, I mentioned this before, but there should be a pluralism in terms of how we understand relevance. Because relevance cannot only be tied to what we understand as relevant today. And the fifth and the final point is history of economic thought in, uh, in a particular way. It acknowledges experiential knowledge, if I were to call it that way. Some sense, uh, William Petty's medical experience, um, being a physician, Cantillon, when he's writing, there was banking experience, uh, Marx's experience. Keynes' experience of the Great Depression. This is a particular kind of experiential uh, knowledge which would have impacted the way they uh, wrote about their theories. But I, I'm, I'm also interested in other kind of experience that I want to talk about, uh, which is what is found in literature, or we call it fiction. But I think that the kind of experience that is contained in works of fiction are also of an extremely important kind. And I think history of economic thought as a subfield of economics allows us to engage with multiple kinds of knowledge, which traditionally may not be in the domain of uh, scholarly study or might not be considered as rigorous. So now let me just um, make some concluding arguments or concluding points, really. I think that there are different methods of doing research in history of economic thought. Uh, and with critical engagement, what we are trying to do is we are preserving these ideas because it is important that we engage with as many ideas uh, as possible. But we are also creating uh, because we are engaging with different texts. And between reading texts and our context, we are able to create uh, maybe new perspectives and new insights of engaging with these uh, ideas and texts. The question then is how to assess rigor. And I think my submission here in this presentation has been that there are different ways to understand rigor. and if somebody thinks of rigor in, in terms of econometrics or with of a particular method, that can only be one kind of rigor. That understanding of rigor cannot be applied to other domains of knowledge. Similarly, how to understand relevance? There has to be a pluralistic understanding of relevance too, just like there has to be uh, rigor as understood in different domains of knowledge. And in, I mean, if somebody is interested to pursue history of economic thought, there are journals, there are societies which publish uh, these articles. And let me come to the teaching of economics. And I'm grateful to uh, Johnson Joyce for all, already raising this point, uh, which is that in, in our curriculum, we can include history of economic thought at the BA level, MA level, and the PhD level. And in fact, I think there was one, I mean, one time when I was teaching this uh, history of economic thought course, a student in the feedback mentioned that, why can we not have more e history of economic thought courses? Why can we not have HET 1, 2, and 3? And I never thought about that until then. But it made sense because if we have microeconomics 1 and 2, and it is a method of doing economics, why can we not have history of economic thought 1 and 2? Uh, the second point is about a kind of critical pedagogy. Depending on the of economy, I think that it endows us with a certain way to critically engage with the text conceptually, methodologically, and in a sociological sense. And this kind of critical pedagogy that history of economic thought endows us with can be easily used in several other courses as well. And 
final, the one final point which I said I would make uh, when I mentioned uh, Peter Gronewigan's uh, reprints of economic classics, which he did, was this question of editing and translating, which I think is also an extremely valuable uh, form of scholarship. And I want to just end with this, that why can we not have, um, I don't know whether it exists, but my assumption is not, but why can we not have a Malayalam edition of Smith and Ricardo? So why is it that uh, we only have to, re I mean, if people are interested in reading uh, in Malayalam, why can we not have these editions? And this question of editing and translation and reprinting goes to all languages, not just Malayalam, but because it is SB College, I've just mentioned the Malayalam point. And with that, I end the lecture. And thank you very much, uh, everyone, for listening. Thank you, sir, thank you, sir. for those uh, valuable words. Uh, now, before we move on with the program, uh, we'll be having a short uh, question answer um, question answer session. Uh, so, uh, students as well as uh, teachers uh, who have significant doubts regarding uh, history of economic thought can raise their questions right now. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, so this question will be directly relevant uh, to your topic, uh, but uh, I think uh, it's very important we, uh, we discuss this topic. Uh, it's, uh, the question is that um, uh, we have seen that in the present days how uh, history is taunted or how uh, it's manipulated uh, for Western interests. So uh, how much uh, repercussions do you think uh, these manipulations of economic history can make uh, uh, on our, uh, on our political life. Yeah, so I think yeah, you're right that probably it's not directly relevant, but uh, the way I'm going to answer this question is to say that I think that history in the political realm or the way you're talking about history is deeply contested and people are engaging with history in multiple ways. But what we find in economics is quite the opposite. Nobody is engaging with history. Nobody is engaging really with the history of ideas or why a certain idea is dominant or why certain textbooks are dominant. So I think that, I mean, for something to be manipulated, one needs to engage with it first. And what, I mean, if I can make a very blanket and a generalized statement, I think the economics profession as a whole and in general across the world, I don't think there is a sufficient engagement with the history of economic ideas. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so I don't have a question. I would like to know what book you would suggest for a person who has got no, um, you know, introduction into uh, history of economic thought. What? Where can I start? Start reading. What would be a good starting point? Yeah. So let me. I think I'll just respond in chat to this. Um, so if you are a student uh, who is, I mean, who has not done economics really, and maybe in the first year. I think you can look at uh, Heinz Fuchs's economic thought book, which is uh, addressed to the general reader. But if you are uh, somebody who has some engagement with economics, um, then you can look at Alessandro Gonzaglia's book called A Wealth of Ideas. So both of them, I mean, if you search online, you should be able to uh, be able to access it. Or, yeah. So the first is really for a general audience. But if you're more interested in depth in the economics of it, or maybe if you're a second year or a third year student in economics, you could look at uh, Rontaglia's, um, it's a big book uh, called The Wealth of Ideas. But there are shorter, there are concise versions of Rontaglia's book as well. So. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, I also had a, uh, like a similar doubt uh, as in, uh, it's, it's like a general question. And then nowadays, uh, due to this COVID pandemic and stuff, uh, world leaders, world economies are looking into uh, their economies, their own economies, like how they can improve themselves, how they can improve their countries, how they can improve transnational relations. So given that you had mentioned a lot of uh, economists, you know, ranging from Marx to even we are learning um, in our uh, in our last semester, we are learning. Uh, uh, we have a paper on history of economic thought. So there, we start off with David Ricardo and all a lot of other economists. So, given the current circumstances, how can their uh, findings or how can their teachings be relevant in this present century? Like, 
given the fact we have a pandemic, we have different types of various societal issues and problems and so on. Yeah. Um, so okay, let me just make two points as a response to that. One is, uh, I mean, COVID, I think uh, what it has done is it has really affected our networks in multiple ways, whether it's a network or production or consumption. But if you take mainstream economics, especially let's take microeconomics, it's fundamentally a theory of exchange. We're talking about how people exchange. I mean, you start off from a Robinson Crusoe economy and then you talk about general equilibrium or you talk about market failure. But if you, uh, let's say, study Smith or Ricardo or Marx, they're all fundamentally talking about a theory of production. In other words, they recognize the structural interdependence that is present in the economy, which also tells us that if there is a shock to an important sector in the economy, it has cascading effects across the economy. I think the, the, the lens, the theory that you use to understand our surroundings has a huge impact on what we think is happening and what kind of policies we recommend. So to me, uh, employing a uh, particular economic, which is based on a theory of production, is much more fruitful to understand any economy uh, compared to uh, the neoclassical exchange one. That's uh, point number one. The second point is, in India, 60% of us depend on agriculture directly for uh, employment. And if you look at um, many curriculums uh, in economics, Agriculture does not figure as a separate course. And if you look at the theories, let's say that we look at microeconomic theory. Is there a separate chapter for agriculture? Is it integrated into it? In macroeconomics, is there an engagement with agriculture? But if you're interested in this question, and uh, if, if, I mean, if, uh, if one reads uh, people like Francois Kenne, who is a physiocrat, and at that time, they were talking about the importance of agriculture and giving agriculture preeminence and there are many things that uh, they have written about agriculture which i think are still remain useful of course we cannot directly import them we have to understand the uh, indian context but still remain useful in understanding the current uh, indian situation